In Alhamdulillah, Nahmadu wa Nasta'in wa Nastaghfiru. Indeed, all praise is due to Allah, and as such, we should praise Him. We should seek His help and seek His forgiveness. وَنَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ شُرُورِ أَنفُسِنَا وَمِنْ سَيَّاتِ عَمَالِنَا And we should seek refuge in Allah from the evil which is within ourselves and the evil which results from our deeds. مَنْ يَهْدِهِ اللَّهِ فَلَا مُضِلَّ لَهُ Wherever Allah is guided, none can misguide. وَمَنْ يُدْلِلْ فَلَا هَادِيَ لَهُ And whoever Allah has allowed to go astray, none can guide. وَأَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ And I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship but Allah who is alone without any partner. وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ And I bear witness that Muhammad was his last messenger and slave. In the previous episode of our series on the seven habits for raising good children, that is good Muslim children, we looked at the first four habits. Before looking at the first habit, we spoke about the importance of making certain choices before the child even is born. Among them, it's choosing a good husband and a good wife. The first of the habits was to make dua or supplication for a righteous children as those before us did, mentioned in the Qur'an, the prophets and those around them prayed for righteous children. The second habit that we spoke about was that the children have a right to righteous parents, that their parents be of the muttaqeen, those who have taqwa, who fear God, who live righteous lives. They have the correct concept of God and they apply the principles of Islam in their lives. The third habit was that the parents, being righteous, also exhibit a good example for the children, that the children learn from the parents. So how are the children to be raised properly if the parents cut corners? They give bad examples to the children. It's essential that the parents be the best example. The fourth principle was attachment parenting. That the child be given its right to breastfeeding. Instead of being given a bottle or a pacifier or whatever, the breast is there. And that's what should be the, given to the child. It's, that's the right of the child. It's only for a period of time, two years, and then end of story. So during those two years, they should have the right. God created the breast for the child. So why deny them, giving them a bottle with bottled milk, which doesn't have the kind of material that human milk has? It's incomparable to human milk. It's only used and should only be used as an act of desperation. That's the only thing left, only option left. Now the fifth habit is connected to education. That it's the right of the child that they be educated Islamically. That's their right. That they be given a solid Islamic foundation in education. That aqidah belief in God and everything connected to it, this should be instilled in the children right from the very beginning. They should be aware of Allah. If possible, let the first word that they utter be Allah. They should be conscious of Allah. When they're being talked to, things are explained to them relative to Allah. So we should try to instill in them a love for Allah and at the same time, a fear of Allah's displeasure. We should talk to them about heaven and hell. Some people think, why not? Why put this on kids? You know, this thing of hell, maybe heaven, okay, but hell, punishment, fire, and all this, you know, scary stuff. Don't tell them. No. Why? Why should they not know the consequence? We're hitting them if they don't do what we want them to do. I mean, they're experiencing something of hell in this life. They understand what it means to be hurt. 
So to let them understand in the overall sense that we try to do the right thing and the good thing to avoid a punishment to come. This should be instilled in their minds. And they can understand it on the level that they're able to understand it. Of course, we don't need to give them the full details and all these kinds of things. But just enough for them to understand that there is a heaven and hell, they will be judged, whatever they do, Allah knows they can't escape the judgment. But we could say in general, though we let them know about the hellfire, etc., our focus should be on the love of Allah and His mercy. And that should be the overwhelming element that we should speak about when speaking about the life to come. We should also instill in them a love of the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad wasallam. They should know who he is. The first stories that we should tell them is about him. His life should be imprinted in their minds. And then we should link it to following him. Not just telling them the story for the sake of the story, but that they try to live lives which follow the way that he taught. And they let the child know we do this or we do that because the Prophet said to do it or the Prophet did it that way. May God's peace and blessing be upon him. And we explain to them as we talk to them about heaven and hell that the way of the Prophet is the way to paradise. So they make that connection. Also, we should give them formal lessons in both aqidah, which has to do with Allah, how we conceive Allah, and also in akhlaq or manners, correct Islamic manners. We should also teach them the basics uh, as early as they're able to grasp them. Basics of prayer, for example. Um, definitely by the age of seven, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had said, we should teach our children prayer by the age of seven. But prayer by the age of seven doesn't mean as is commonly understood among people, that we only teach them to go through the motions, or maybe referred to as, you know, a monkey prayer. You can teach a monkey how to pray, so we teach our kids how to pray, they do the same thing. No. Teaching them how to pray means also we teach them about wudu, how to wash themselves before prayer, they're conscious of it, and we teach them what is said in the prayer, and that they understand it, you know, of course to the level of their age. But teaching them how to pray means everything connected with it. The little girls should be taught about hijab, etc. Though it's not compulsory on them, you know. And they should know in terms of Islamic dress, you know, elements of shyness. They should have a shyness to expose themselves. We want to develop that from the early stages. As I said, it is important that they develop the early practices uh, which may be possible at their age level. Fasting, for example, you know, they may not be able to fast every day of Ramadan, but maybe a couple of days, whatever, we reward them for it. And we start to develop in them as much of the practices as we can. We're going to take a break here now and uh, come back after the break to continue to look at the education of the Muslim child. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah. All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. Welcome back as we continue to look at the seven habits of successfully raising Muslim children. We were talking previously about the importance of teaching the children some of the basics. Zakah. Of course, they don't have enough money to give charity, but we can still teach them about charity. Because the basic principle of Zakah is generosity. So it's good for us to teach them to be generous. So if we're out in the public, um, and we come across poor people, beggars, whatever, give the child something and let them give to that needy person. Let them get a sense of 
charity and being charitable. Furthermore, we should teach the children Islamic stories, whether they're Quranic stories, whether they're stories of the Sahaba, you know, early Muslim scholars, their lives, etc. Let them grow up on these stories instead of the usual trash that's available on the market, you know, where kids know all kinds of foolishness out there. Stories which really don't build moral character. These other stories, we're talking about stories of the prophets, stories of the Sahaba, etc. These are stories which show people who lived exemplary lives. And these are real people. We don't need to go to fiction when we have sufficient uh, information, you know, which is accurate and correct about people, righteous people of the past. And furthermore, we should take advantage of their strong memories at this age. Children at that age, at this age, are able to retain material much more easily than when they get older. As they get older, their minds become filled with so many other things and they don't have the ability to retain as they are able to at that age. So we should try to teach them the Quran early. They can learn how to read the Quran from the time they're around three years old to pick up a Quran and read it themselves. Most people delay and leave it until they're older because in doing so, they think that the child is not capable. So what's actually happening is that they are projecting their misunderstandings of the children's capabilities onto the children. So if the children are not required or encouraged to memorize the Quran until they're much older, then that's when they will memorize it. However, there are many, many cases of people completing the Quran, the whole memorization of Quran, when they're five years old, six years old, seven years old. You know, all of that occurs. So we shouldn't limit them based on our own misunderstandings. We should give them every opportunity to learn the Quran at this point in time, in the earliest ages. They can learn it by memorizing, just hearing and memorizing, until they're able to actually read and memorize. And we should also show them in our own practice, as well as encourage them to love the things which Allah loves. Why do we love this? Why do we love that? Because Allah loves it. Why do we dislike this and dislike that? Because Allah dislikes it. We want to give them that connection. It's not about, well, mom and dad dislike it, so that's why we don't do it. You know, it's because Allah dislikes it. We try to link all of the various activities with the children to Allah. And we should make ruqya for the children. That is, we teach them before going to sleep at night that they say the three quls. Of course, this is where they're able to memorize these and say them and explain the meetings to them. We have them do it. Blow in their hands and wipe it over their bodies. This is ruqya. We do it for them until they're able to do it for themselves. They should be taught it as a regular practice. The Prophet did it himself encouraged it be, to be done because it was also one of the means of protection. It is also good for us to use everyday incidents to teach them. Whenever we're out and about with the children and we see something which is wrong or something which is good, we try to use those incidents as a means for them to learn and to grow in their understanding of good and evil, right and wrong. And we should also build for them a little Islamic library. As much as we can, we get Islamic books for them to read. And especially in Arabic, you know, we want to encourage them at the early age to learn Arabic because actually these small kids, ages one, two, three, and so on, so they're capable of learning two, three, four different languages at the same time. You have many cases of this. So we shouldn't restrict the children's exposure to other languages, and to reading, learning, you know, based on our own misjudgments or based on our own laziness or negligence, etc. Last but not least, among the things that it's good to do with the children is to give them projects. Give them some activities which are Islamic, fundamentally Islamic for them to do. So they 
uh, get a sense of responsibility of trying to fulfill something, you know. And we, we try to connect as much of what we, we do to Islam itself. Now, the sixth method or sixth habit is providing for the children a positive Islamic environment. Because on one hand, we want to educate the children. We said we have to be good examples for them. And we want to provide information for them. At the same time, the environment, the household environment in which they live, should be a peaceful environment. If, for example, husband and wife have conflicts, they shouldn't do it in front of the children. Better to do it behind closed doors, and of course conflicts will occur in family. But it's better for the children to see, you know, the girls to see mother being obedient to the father, you know, and the boys to see the father, you know, being just, being kind, you know, being understanding to the mother. So the best parents being on the best behavior, this is very important because that creates a positive environment for the children to learn from and to grow up in. Among the things that the parents need to do in terms of providing a good environment for them, for the children, is that they must be consistent in how they deal with their children. There should be an agreement between parents that one doesn't do one thing and the other does another. Because the child quickly learns that, okay, if mom doesn't agree, then dad might. You know, so they run to dad. There should be that consistency that they feel that what's right, both parents stand behind it. What's wrong, both parents oppose it. The environment of the home should be as Islamic as possible in the sense that the Quran should be read regularly in the home along with the children by both parents. They should see it, hear it, whether it's on tape recorder or CDs or whatever, or them actually reciting it. And then, people who come to the home should be, and for the most part, religious people also, who will bring their children who are religious, and that's the environment that the children grow up in, playing with other kids who are themselves, you know, religious, or from religious homes. So they don't see the worst of behavior as, as much as possible. But one shouldn't keep in the home non-Islamic magazines or books, things which the little children may pick up and read without you realizing it, seeing and learning what is not really appropriate. The internet, now children are getting on it quite easily, quite young. This has to be monitored. They shouldn't be left on their own because they can easily be sucked into corruption on the internet. We have to also teach the children as we teach them right and wrong, they should know that simply because somebody does wrong, it doesn't mean you don't like them or you don't do anything with them, you know. They have to get the balance. They should know on one hand, know right and wrong, but at the same time, they have to develop a sort of sense of tolerance because for the kids, black and white, things tend to appear just black and white. This is wrong, so we really don't have anything to do with that person. But... That may be in your family. You may have family members who are doing things which are wrong. And, you know, there should be a relationship between the child and the family members. The other thing, when we speak about the positive environment, that could involve removing from the environment negative, other negative factors. Uh, the environment, not necessarily only of the home, but external environment. The school that we choose for the children to go to, it should be an Islamic school. That's the right of the child that they get their education, their formal education in an Islamic environment. So we should go out of our way to make sure that the children get that foundation. And of course, the television. Back in the home as well as outside the home when we visit other people, we have to be in control of it. And if we can control it, the children have access to it freely, then it's better not to have it. Or only turn it on when we're around. You know, very, very important because like the internet, the 
television has good material, but it also has a lot of uh, corruptive uh, material which will damage our children who want to raise them well, who want to raise them as good Muslims then. We have to be in full control of what happens in the home. The seventh habit is the disciplinary system that we institute in the home. It shouldn't be one of beat the heck out of the children, you know, uh, whenever we get upset. Otherwise, we're loving and etc. But we just uh, are inconsistent in our dealing with them. They should be handled in a consistent manner. We don't hit them out of anger. We hit them when they, as a last resort when they've done wrong. We try to use the timeout principle, you know, isolating them when their behavior is not appropriate uh, as a means of controlling their behavior. We also add a lot of positive reinforcement, you know, support, uh, admiration, praise when they do well. You know, we don't just deal with discipline from the negative perspective. We try to bring both sides. With these principles, we do have a chance of raising good Muslim kids. And we should try to implement them to the greatest degree that we can. But dua, calling on Allah, as seeking his help before, during, and after is something that we should never forget. We have a duty as parents to raise good Muslim kids. I ask Allah to help us fulfill that duty. With that, I bid you all farewell. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.